Hello, Rob here from BotCopy. You're about to watch our latest writing and design live session. Brielle Nikoloff from Botmock joined as co-presenter. Her educational background is in neuroscience and linguistics, and she's an expert in conversational design. A uh, brief reminder who we are, BotCopy is software that makes it not only possible, but very easy to connect Google's conversational AI tools like Google Assistant and Dialogflow to your website. Now, this can make your website more satisfying to use, and the benefits to you range from a major boost in engagement and revenue to a reduction in the time and resources you need to spend. This reduction can be so vast as to invite skepticism, but the reduction is real. For case studies on that, see our blog. One last note, the session has been edited to save you time. We skip the intro and dive right in. We've cut some tangents and chit chat, but if that stuff sounds good to you, join us for an upcoming live session. Just go to our website and ask our bot about sessions. That's it, here's the episode, enjoy. clear, concise, and upbeat. If you're doing this for a week or you're doing it for 20 years, you can't ever hear this enough. These are examples of real life response types in a chat bot. And you see the before version and you see the after version. What do you know, what jumps out at you as the difference between these two, befores and afters? There's at least three differences. They're visually smaller. Right, okay. Shorter copy is really important. If you don't have short copy, you add more friction, more cognitive load. If you can't say it in one breath, don't put it in your chat bubble because it becomes nothing like a natural chat experience and it defeats the purpose of chat. Any other things anyone notices? There's uh, less buttons on the right. Well, there's definitely more or different variation of ways to interact. So here's a card. This, this big square here, this copy was able to be shortened because we added a basic card. This basic card has a graphic. There's actually more chips here. And there's a reason for that. Why do you think we might have more chips? There are things in this copy that people might not care about. You don't wanna dump a bunch of data on them until you know what they're interested in. We shorten this and then we give them the option to continue unpacking what you're saying. And the third one here, the third biggest difference is it sends users to existing assets. And that goes hand in hand with if they wanna unpack it more, you can send them to something else that already exists. In terms of Hemingway, um, when you visit it at HemingwayApp.com, it's a free app, you're going to see this yellow and pink. And you see over here on the right, you've got a grade six readability, you got 133 words. Now you can play with this, it's like a little game. Um, and if you do it right, everything suddenly turns uh, clear. There's no more pink and there's no more yellow. And you see now on the right, it's grade four. If you take copy like this, put it in here, make it all clear. Once it's all clear, you still have to tweak it. If you're wondering how much copy to put into a chat bubble, for instance, you wanna limit it to 400 characters. How many? My opinion, 400 characters is the pain point. If you have to use a lot of characters, be really disciplined and don't let yourself use more than 400. And this, again, this is only for chatbots, um, for the visual kind of like text chatbots. For voice, that convention is probably much lower, I would imagine, and Brielle can touch upon that. But the reason for that is because we can all read at least twice as fast, if not more, than listening to a robot talk, which is a slow, you know, low bandwidth experience. And so you want to have even fewer. But, it, but for chatbots, it's okay to have kind of a long, chunky paragraph but you do not want to put them into a brick wall situation like this. If it gets higher than that, you've got your bag of tricks right here. You can chop it up, save some of that stuff for later. You can say, do you want to hear about X? Instead of writing about it, just say, that's that part. You know, Now, if you want to hear about this part, click here and I'll take you to a different response. You mentioned with Grammarly and Hemingway, the Hemingway app making things more concise. Uh, what are ways to test to make it sound more com conversational? Uh, versus just written language. Um, by uh, we already covered clear and concise. This part here is a little bit more hard to quantify scientifically, um, but I do have a few tricks. And I also believe that clarity and concision is nine tenths of tone. So if you are short, that lets people know that you are conscientious and that's a personality trait. So that alone gets you close, but then how do you avoid being curt? How do you avoid being too abrupt? 
and how do you sound conversational? This is where the art comes in. You can use an exclamation point, you can use an emoji, and you can just try to be aware of how you talk to your friends when you chat. Tone of voice is, is about also just empathy. People don't know if you're being you know, straight faced when you say something. How many times have you texted somebody and they respond um, with no punctuation and you don't know if they're being monotone and sarcastic or if they're being friendly? You have no way of knowing, right? You have to, if you say hello, it could be like sarcastic, like hello. But if you say hello with an exclamation point, it sounds happy. Don't assume that people know your tone. Make sure that everybody knows your tone by adding little details. Yeah, no, yeah, uh, makes sense, um, especially upbeat. I mean, I think when it comes to UX, um, people talk about adding delight. So I think it's along those lines. Um, very yes. similar. Yeah. Be in a good mood when you write. And one final note, there's a lot of discussion about personality that's unique to your bot. Um, I actually think that's overemphasized, this idea idea of giving your bot distinctive personality. If you're just clear, concise, and happy sounding, that's enough. We had a, our own bot say something about pricing, but we didn't want to hit you over the head with all the different pricing plans. That would have been a brick wall. I call it a brick wall when it's a lot of copy. So we shot them over to the uh, pricing plan page. Here's a bad response. Take a look at it for a second. Um, Austin, you're you're a chatbot writer. So what would what what jumps out to you? It could definitely be more concise. Um, let me going off of your uh, your language that you said. Um, it could be concise, and it seems like it's trying to tell me everything it can do all at once um, instead of leading me to a specific direction. Okay, so that's two things actually. It's it's telling you everything it can do at once, and it's also not leading you to a specific direction. So this is what we did. Is it clear? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. It's obviously quite concise. And does it feel a little bit more upbeat? Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that it's just more colloquial. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I never use welcome in chatbots or voice bots um, because it's just so antiquated and it sounds like an old in, uh, phone IVR voice response. So I don't use welcome and I don't use what can I help you with. Um, and that's you took, well, you didn't have welcome, but you did take out the, what can I help? Right. You? How often do you still see those antiquated things? All the time. And it's, and half the time when I sit down to write, I still, my instinct is to say welcome to blah, blah, blah. But it's hard to break that habit. You're, you're not welcoming them to something. You're saying hi to them. <laughs> There's a difference. Right. But I don't even say hi. I just tell them what to do talk with me about bot copy it's like it's pretty it's pretty aggressive we don't i don't think this is our current one but this was one of our iterations anyone else yeah i rob i it's phil i you know what i see here is a little bit about almost how you would reconfigure a web page and in that in the beginning you might design it the way you think people want to respond to your web page and then after several months you look at you look at your analytics and see what page most of them go on to and when you see that, you then make those hyperlinks more readily available in front of it. And what you're basically doing here is saying, you know what, for all intent and purposes, people are coming to this for three reasons. They want to get started free, they want to know what bot copy is, and they want to get help with dialogue flow. And that's what you recognized and get and just sort of presented it to them, for, which makes total sense. And we found we did the same with our bot as well. We just stopped and started looking at what our users were doing with our bot and therefore made the flow through it, much with your help actually, significant with the last time we talked to you um, and helped flow uh, uh, the conversational flow in that in that in that path based on what they've said in the past that's a fantastic point just like web pages you want to take data and see what people are doing and then change it accordingly you know I also come from the old school advertising world where we didn't have data so when we did a, a national print campaign we were kind of shooting in the dark and I, dr. Phil you probably remember those days when creativity reigned and data didn't in terms of the ad industry. Oh, so, yeah. Oh, yeah. So what we, and that wasn't such a bad thing um, because it was really a, a creative era. Um, but there are certain things that hold true even without data that can get you at least halfway there. Um, and when you use those tricks right out of the gates, instead of waiting for data, um, instead of possibly alienating those first comers to your, to your website, um, you're making sure that the most important people, which are the first people, the, the most interested people, actually are treated 
as well as you possibly can treat them. And so the this kind of technique seems to come up in the data to prove that it should be like this. So it's it's a combination of data and also I think best practices, which are often common sense but but often overlooked. Uh, um, I have a question. Yes, that please. It works like I'm seeing in English, but does it work the same way in other languages? Our bots are Spanish made. So does it work the same way? We come from a different different culture, so everybody here is expecting that you have you have to say hello, hi, how are you doing, what are you doing, everything. So in this sentence, you are like cutting everything and putting something very, very straight. So, I got it. So there's cultural differences, and I, I do know that yeah. because when we talk to say Thailand or Japan versus, you know, the US or, or a New Yorker, you know, it's totally different. Some some people you need to get to know them first and say hi and become friends before you even begin to talk about business. It still needs to be short, but it does need to be culturally spot on. So use your instincts and say, hello, so happy to see you. How are you doing? But I, I'm pretty sure, and I'll ask you, to, in your in Colombia, is it okay to have a very long paragraph at the beginning? Or would you also agree that concision is important? I agree with you. Concision is important. Okay. Uh, I don't like to read many things at the right. same time. So I right. agree with that part. You know, your writers will have to do something that feels right. And then you'll have to see how people respond. This is really more to illustrate a, something that's colloquial, like Brielle said, and something that's short. Um, okay, perfect. Mo thank moving you. on. Mo thank you so much for the question. Again, another thing you notice here is that I'm not packing everything into here. I don't want to be redundant. Don't say something in your bubble if you're saying it here. So that would be if the bot says, I can tell you what bot copy is and how it works and you can get started free and I can tell you why we're using Dialogflow and also I can show you some rich media. Select below. You know, how silly is that? Yeah, and, and with text, we have the luxury of um, having many options to just click on. With voice, you do have to actually state every single thing. It's just a real challenge and I'm curious to know how you deal with that. But in chat, luckily, we have the luxury to have a visual interface that makes it really quick and low friction. I think these are bad welcomes for chat. I don't think they're so bad for voice. Does anyone want to hazard a guess as to why I think these are bad welcomes? Well, the first the first one is going to add a, a whole conversational turn, which is going to extend the time that the user can get from initiation to a solution and two through four are again not um they're just open-ended so able to actually establish the scope of what you're going to do for them and then you go from there then that can help yeah uh, yeah i feel like there's so many things that you don't have to queue in in real life uh, like if you're at a bank you're there to get money or you, there's some banking transaction that you're going to do you don't have to the, the teller doesn't have to tell the person uh, what they can do. So it's already, there's already some kind of cooperation that's already been established. I think that it's important to have that after you just say hello or hi or whatever um, the initial greeting is. What can you do for me? It's nice for them to say hi, but it's a little bit fluffy to, to not go right into, to not transition quicker into the, the business at hand. Um, I agree with that if that's what you mean, and I yeah. think it was well expressed. Now, this, these four that you're seeing come preloaded in Dialogflow under the default tab. These might be useful for hobbyists or for people building voice skills, but they should not be your opener for chatbots. Here's something that I feel is much better. So take a look at this. This has you know a very short, concise, clear opening. It's not open-ended. It doesn't say feel free to ask anything if you say ask me anything you're you're promising the user implicitly that you can answer anything and you're very likely to result with a default which is when your bot can't answer and that's what we want to avoid and if you're a little bit you know clever with how you structure your openings you can avoid those defaults try not to be open ended diving in a little bit now into a specific intent what could go wrong here let's take a look at this simple response what do you think a user might ask as a follow-up that could trip up the bot. What's the dashboard? That's perfect. When I wrote this, I was expecting my brother to look at it. 
And he'll, <laughs> so knowing him, I was thinking he'd say, what's a widget? What I did anticipating, and this is a nice thing to do if you're chatbot builders, don't just wait for the data to come in. Yes, the data matters and you should be watching it every day and I'll show you how to do that, but also anticipate reasonable follow-ups. It is reasonable for someone to say what, what's a widget or what's a dashboard. So take a second and make a follow-up. Okay, so I target a word or a phrase that you're worried that someone might want to unpack and then just make a quick follow-up. How do you do that? You go to your intent, your how does it work intent, and you create a follow-up called widget. And within that follow-up, you create a new response. Now, if this happens, if you're lucky enough for this to happen, you just made a friend for life because they now think, wow, they, they anticipated my curiosity, they have empathy, and I'm impressed. And also, I know what a widget is now. So it's, it's a great thing to, to be able to do, whether you do this with forethought and intuition or whether you do it through data, this is what you're going for. And if anyone uses Dialogflow, this is the crux of why we use Dialogflow, because we want to have more conversational experiences that feel real, as opposed to putting you in one bucket and then handing you off to a human, which is not why we do this. Here's another example. Someone might wanna know, what counts as a conversation when you use bot copy? Is it just one sending one chat, one query, or is it a whole conversation? This turns out to be something that people ask a lot. So we have a follow-up for it. Another way to do this, and probably the best way to do this in most cases, is using a tool like Dashbot or Chatbase, um, or even just Dialogflow uh, history. You can see what people are doing with your bot. And every day I look and see what people typed in and I go and I quickly patch up a hole by either adding a new intent, a follow-up intent, or fleshing out my training phrases so that a training phrase I hadn't accounted for is added to an existing intent. This is an old version of how I, our team used to create the beginning stages of our bots. So conversations can be tricky, especially when they're not linear. When you don't have a linear happy path, conversations become horizontal. They become unique to the user, almost like a fingerprint. The journey they take towards their goal can go in any order with any language they use. And so we tried to map things out like this just because we didn't have any better solution at the time. When I used to put the copy or one of my partners in these little blue boxes, I did not labor over the perfect wording. Just put in something that popped into my head because the wording changes. So try to keep it loose at the beginning. On the topic of maps, this is a good time to switch over to Brielle because as I mentioned before, she's the project manager at Botmock, which is a fantastic tool for exactly this kind of thing prior to putting it into something like Dialogflow. Thanks, Rob. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'll give it away to Brielle. As Rob mentioned, I'm Botmock's product manager. So I think about this question all the time. How do we actually empower people to uh, create a mental model of the conversation that they're building and then easily uh, design it and prototype it? All right, can you see that? Yes. Looks good. Cool, so I'll run through, I'll, I'll kind of back up and go into um, a little bit more of the more general process that I follow when creating some kind of conversational experience. So broadly, I'll go through research and how you ensure that you're actually creating uh, this experience for something that is actually a good idea, like will users get anything out of it? Um, or can they complete this task in some better way? Um, and then the design and the implementation and how I've tested in the past, iterated on that, and then how you launch it. So, yeah, one of the main things with any kind of conversational experience, whether you're talking about chat or voice, is it really needs to be solving a real problem that you don't think can be solved in a better way. So. For chat, you're more you're assuming that they're the user is already interacting with the screen. So if that user can accomplish a given task 
and fewer clicks or um, fewer uh, ha having to read less not in a chatbot, then there's no reason to create a chatbot for it. But the power of conversation can really shine when you think through fits that really are helping a user out and, and kind of empowering them in a way that just an app or a website by itself can't. So we always list our assumptions about why somebody is kind of, why they would need to be engaging with it from the get-go. Um, and then that way you can really isolate what you're solving and establish the scope of what you're going to be delivering for them. Are they going to be um, finding information somehow? Are they going to be completing a transaction? Are they trying to be entertained through some kind of trivia chatbot? If you answer these questions um, past this stage, then things can go sideways really quickly. So it's really important to establish exactly what uh, everything that your chatbot is going to be delivering or voice experience. So um, looking at this, you've got one, two, three, four conversational exchanges or linguists uh, like to call it adjacency pairs, it's just like a fancy conversational term. So you are engaging the user for some amount of time, right? In order to have a conversation, that conversation needs to span some time, whether it's voice or chat. So you're already, if you're going to be um, engaging with them in conversation, you need to understand that you are inherently going to be um, taking up some of their time. And, and to Rob's points about clarity and brevity, um, by ensuring you do that, you're, you're helping to maximize um, to be respectful of their time, really. So is it possible to achieve what you see here in a simple form, uh, kind of like a plug in, you plug it in and you go? I'm, I, I constantly come up around, uh, across chatbots that, that, are, that take up so many conversational turns when really I could just plug in a date, a time, and one other piece of info and get the answer. I could just type it. I type it in, I press tab, type it in, tab, or I just auto corrects or auto fills it and, and then I have it instead of like literally typing with the chat box. So, um, so yeah, thinking about this from the get go is really important because there are just a lot of voice and chat experiences that could just be better solved by clicking or typing like one thing. Um, yeah, and by establishing the scope, persona, and specific features of the experience, you're setting the scene for everything that you and your teammates are going to be doing. So um, Rob briefly touched on um, persona and mentioned that he, he really believes that, you know, if you are just upbeat and kind of like friendly and warm, that you can take care of uh, a lot of what voice and conversation designers really harp on when they're talking about persona. And that is true to some extent. Um, I think one of the things that often happens with conversation design is that people believe that when you're saying the word persona, you're, uh, you're thinking about marketing personas. You're, you're thinking about like, oh, uh, Adriana is 25 and her favorite type of uh, gemstone is turquoise and she has four guinea pigs. It's like, what is the point of, of having a chatbot or a voice bot with all these useless details, you know? Um, what's, what's really necessary when you're thinking about the feel and the tone of the bot is really, again, relates back to exactly what it's doing for the user. So if you are if you are providing health information to somebody, maybe um, this chatbot is designed to help people figure out if they're exhibiting symptoms of COVID, 
you may want a slightly different tone than if you are um, talking to people about what bot copy is, right? And again, as Rob said, that really goes, it's not as quantifiable, but it can help to just use empathy to think about what headspace your user is in, right? If, if, they're, if, if this chatbot's designed to help them find back pain relief, then it's, it's probable that they're in pain right now. So you may want to be slightly more um, aware of this in your, in your wording and not be maybe as um, cold if, or you, you don't ever really want to be cold, but um, you want to be to the point, but also empathetic and, and see if you can reflect that in your language, right? So yeah, when, once we do this, we really, in, it can be very tempting to, um, to want to jump into the flow, right? To like start dragging and dropping boxes and all that fun stuff. It, before doing that, it's really important to start thinking about just a sample dialogue, right? Um, and that's what most conversation designers call it, is you kind of just write out um, almost like a script. So I've seen people write scripts in kind of like the old fashioned movie way, um, where you just kind of, you literally kind of, you could just take a template from online and write it out and then a lot of conversation designers that I know that are on enterprise teams um, actually like distribute these scripts and then they read it off like in a conference room. So they just like play the different parts. Um, that may seem tedious and like a lot of work, but as Rob said, like it's, it's not as important to get things right the first time because you're always gonna be able to root out better and more concise ways to say something. And this is especially true with voice because writing, the way we write is, it may as well be a whole different like entity as the way that we speak. Um, they're just two different things. So when we're planning a written, ex uh, sorry, a spoken experience by using um, written language, things, they're just things that we don't notice when we're writing it down. So. Um, other conversation designers I know will actually stand back to back with a teammate and read it off. So like one will be Alexa, one will be the user. And that's another great way to root out things that just don't sound right or are confusing or um, don't have clear enough options because um, even if you just read it to each other and look at each other, there's there's so much nonverbal communication that goes on. like. Um, if I'm looking at the paper and I move my gaze up and look up at the next uh, at my friend, they'll know that it's their turn to speak. Whereas Alexa can't do that, so you're able to like root out things that you otherwise wouldn't be able to by just reading it aloud. And that's still true with chat because you want it to be conversational uh, sounding, right? You don't like kind of just like we talked about with welcome and um, if if you can make it seem like they're talking to someone then that's the best way to go. So, um, so yeah, when I, I don't do the movie script thing, that's just something I saw the other day that another designer was showing me and I kind of liked it, but I, I, just like Rob, I just pull up a, a document and um, start typing it out and I just write out the happy path. So it's, it, it's just easier to start to visualize this in your head and write it out when you're not dragging and dropping boxes every single time that you um, write a new phrase or a response. So once you've written out at least like one kind of core experience, it's good to think about the overarching experience. So uh, again, this goes back to the scope of what you're, of what you're actually solving or, or helping them do. And all too often, I mean, all of us here probably know that when you start designing, things get huge really fast. So it's it's the most important to, especially when you're collaborating with a lot of people or working with a lot of stakeholders, you want to be able to communicate visually what uh, the entire scope of the project without 
having to show them this, which doesn't really tell them much, right? It, it's, it's hard to wrap your head around exactly what's going on here because it has every possible option. So consolidating kind of into a blueprint is something that's worked well for the teams I've been on in the past. And then for tooling, generally speaking, when I interview designers and uh, where I've worked with designers in the past, most of the tools that I've come across have been either starting with pen and paper to uh, write out that sample script or just doing it in Excel or Sheets. And then moving on to like PowerPoint, kind of like this one right here. Mural is great for mind mapping. Miro and Lucidchart, same kind of thing. They just kind of give you a flowcharty kind of tool. Um, obviously, Botmock spans the design, prototype, test, and build phase. And Adobe XD has a tool that um, that's a little more code heavy, but they uh, I don't know if they actually let you test, but they do span kind of these two as well. And then obviously you've got Dialogflow, Rasa, and the Alexa, and the uh, Alexa. Well, it's actually called Amazon Lex is their like natural language system. So, so yeah, tooling can kind of help visualize the process a little bit. And then, like I mentioned, as you go, just lo-fi test it and read it out to yourself aloud. Um, that always helps me. It, it just changes things when you hear it versus when you're reading it because our brain just misses stuff when we're, when we're reading. And again, writing is not a conversational craft. Writing is a monologue. So that's, it's, it's definitely important to test and test and test and refine as Rob was saying as well. And then when you're trying to measure the success, this can be kind of a, a big hurdle at first. So one really important thing to do is use regression testing, meaning that if you add in a new question or intent that your users have been, that, that have been um, surfacing in your data and you want to add that in, you need to make sure that you're not breaking other stuff in the system um, because language is tricky and sometimes when you add one thing, it will just confuse the system completely if it's a synonym or all kinds of crazy things can happen. So if you uh, add something in, you're going to want to test all of the paths to make sure something is not um, leading to a dead end or something. Um, you can check out how many users are actually using it. Obviously, that's a pretty basic metric. You can look at how long the task is taking to complete. That's a really important one, especially if you're trying to maximize time uh, in like a customer service kind of context. You can actually measure the thank yous and negative comments. Um, that is quite illuminating, actually. So I would recommend that. Always look at no match or fallback rates. So a no match would be if I'm asking for uh, information about my clownfish and the system hasn't doesn't have that synonym yet for fish, um, it, would, it wouldn't be able to match that and it would say, sorry, I, didn't, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, fallback rate is just, again, the amount of time that, uh, or fallback rate is when you're surfacing like a, a, I didn't catch that, or can you repeat yourself kind of statement that you program in there. Uh, if your chatbot doesn't have, uh, any open-ended text, then these aren't going to be as relevant, obviously, because they're just clicking buttons. Um, and then number of turns. So this is not a cut and dry metric because sometimes you want somebody to be able to use your chatbot for a long time if it's kind of like an exploratory discovery chatbot. But if you, again, if you're trying to get to minimize the amount of time that somebody has to be engaging with it in order to get um, a receipt that they need or, you know, whatever else that they're trying, that they're after, um, then you want to look at the amount of time and try to minimize it, right? So just be mindful of the context that it's in. And then always looking at drop-off spots is 
can be really helpful too. It can show you where people are confused. It can show you where people are bored. Um, it'll tell you a lot of different things and, and you can always refine the flow based on that. I'm, I'm really happy to be here today. So we have a promo code for, code for everyone here. But um, really quickly about Botmock, this is kind of that flow that I started um, typing out here. So in Botmock, it's nice because you can actually run things as you go. And again, it'll help you sort of test and, and see and kind of like visualize what's happening as you're writing. So um, so if you build out the flow, you can, you can also see uh, and experience it visually as well. Um, to make sure that the questions are making sense, that the flow is making sense. And um, this chatbot I created to help you figure out what kind of um, dog you should adopt. But um, but yeah, and, and then always keeping in mind things like, do you want to implicitly confirm their answer? Do you want to explicitly confirm their answer? Um, do you need to confirm their answer at all? That kind of thing is important, especially with high risk transactions. Like if you're telling a chatbot to transfer $50,000 from checking to savings, you probably want to be able to confirm that in some way and tell them what you did um, instead of just saying, okay, and then like the chatbot closes out. So you like have no idea if it actually did it or not. So um, so yeah, that's, that's something to keep in mind. Um, Letting, letting them know where in um, the conversation they are, especially if they're trying to get something done quickly is really helpful. So here I said, I kind of progressively gave them um, a little notice about which question they're on. And, and in the very first message, you'll see that I kind of gave them a roadmap and said, I'll ask you three questions so that they don't think that they're getting into like a 25 question scenario. They can kind of plan that way. And then, um, yeah, so, oh yeah, last question, big dogs or small dogs? So, it's kind of nice to uh, just be able to run it as you go and, and test things out. And as Rob mentioned uh, really early on as well, it's, it's nice to have visuals to sort of support your, um, your prompts. Um, the other thing that's nice is that you can send it out to people to actually test. So if, if they take this link and open it up, they'll just be able to see the chatbot right there, and then you can get feedback as you go from other people as you test it. How do you test the emotional response of your assistants when you make them? Uh, when they're actually like testing out the well, chatbot. Well, yeah, well, when we're writing, we're trying to, well, yeah, we don't know how they feel. like. If, for instance, like banks or anything, like we're talking about things that have high risk. Um, so how, yeah, all we can do is make assumptions. So how do we test that those assumptions are correct when we write our dialogue? Yeah, so personally, the way I've tested before, and I've never done this with chatbots just because I have less, uh, I've done less with chatbots, but especially for voice, it's been really illuminating to do research and not just record the whole experience so that you can see their face. Because, like I said, like so much of conversation is uh, nonverbal. Like, I don't know, a lot of people estimate that up to 80% is. So, for example, I was making a voice experience for kids. And when I shot the video of kind of the back and forth, there was one prompt that I don't, I don't remember the exact thing, but it was like, um, do you want to hear that song again? yes or no, and the two-year-old just like nodded. And if I had just been recording it, um, I, I wouldn't have even caught that, you know, to know that yeah. she wanted more. So if you can videotape, that's that's gonna be the most useful by far. Um, you can also audio record, but the chat, um, being able to like, so Botmock records that user session and, and you can kind of see how much time they take to respond. Um, you can you can measure that uh, down the line. We'd like to have a recording feature so that you can also see their face and line that up with what they read. But yeah, that's just some of those yeah. I've used. Cool, thank you. Another thing you said, Brielle, about the um, tone of voice is very true, and I kind of 
you know, went through that a little bit too, I made it sound too facile. It isn't just clear, concise and upbeat and, and you're a linguist and, and of course you're right, is that there are certain things you say to, to a medical patient that you would say differently to some uh, teenager who's buying clothes. That's true for everything. I mean, all of us are kind of expert conversationalists. So we automatically on the street, we're asking, what do I do? I wouldn't say I'm a conversation designer necessarily. I would be like, I would kind of in that context. I'd say, have you ever heard of Alexa? Like, do you know about chatbots? Like I, I do kind of design related stuff. Like I, I help define the path and if i were at the alexa conference there's no way i would start with that context robots don't know that yet so that's kind of our job as the designer to figure out how to speak to every possible person that could be coming to your conversation for those of you who joined us at the beginning i had a question just kind of a little game does anyone know the answer so zooming back to the beginning here what is the most important thing about becoming a good bot writer in two words? It's never quit. It's not clarity, concision, and being upbeat. It's about keep pushing forward. We all are here because we want to do great conversational AI. At Bot Copy, we've seen what it can do. It's ridiculously powerful, and it's where the world is going. And the fact that you're even talking to us today, and the fact that you've gravitated to dialogue flow, you're already ahead of the competition. Um, you're going to hit a wall with whether it's fulfillment or like, oh, geez, how do I do this intent or entity? Or how do I do JavaScript functions? Push through that wall. We'll try to make it fun for you. Brielle will try to make it fun. I invite all of you to come to the Slack support community. We've set up a new channel called Writing Sessions so that we can continue this conversation there. Once you get there, do a search for hashtag uh, Writing Session. Uh, and this is the place where you can go in private and say, hey, does this, does this sentence make any sense to you guys? In case you want some advice, I will be there. I will answer every single question that comes in. And that's it. Now, in terms of like things like fulfillment and our advanced features, like for instance, it can see what users are doing on the screen. They click here, they click there. If they come back, the bot can know that. And so we have other sessions for that kind of thing. A fulfillment session, if you want to learn how to connect bot copy and dialogue flow to your various servers so that you can have dynamic information being served up through bot copy. Feel free to sign up for a different session at a different time. And then Brielle, if you have anything coming up, uh, now's a chance to say so. Sure, we do have a few BotMock 101 sessions. So those are monthly and it's just a get started, uh, quick questions about conversation design and best practices. And we also do kind of workshop in those two if you wanna bring your project. And then we do a lot of AMAs. These are once a month too, where we bring in four to five conversation designers from places like Amazon Alexa, Google. Um, we've had someone from uh, Accenture. So uh, they kind of just collaborate and talk about their own experience and we have different themes, so. That sounds <laughs> great. Building bots usually re requires a writer even an art director, a data scientist, a project manager, there's a lot of hats you have to wear. So many of you in this room are going to be wearing all those hats. At some point, you might wanna turn some of this over to a conversational designer, someone who fulfills that role on an AI team, who's really just focusing on the writing. And the more you know about this stuff now, the easier it's gonna to be to delegate that information to people later. I think Austin is one of the, one example of those people who is an actual conversational designer by trade. He's, he's taught me a few things too. So, and uh, that's all I have to say. So thanks so much for your time. Stay safe. Thank you, Brielle. Thank you, Rob. Thanks. Yeah, thank, thank you. Everybody. Okay, bye. Right, bye. Care, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Brielle. This was great.